All right, gang, we are back for another study. And I want to kind of go over um, a recap of what we did last study here with uh, the age of flesh and uh, before we jump into what we're studying today. So when we went over the last one, we kind of went over the six days of creation. And some would might say that this is 6,000 years because the day with the Lord is 1,000 years and 1,000 years is one day. And the topic in Second Peter chapter 3 was referring to the creation as well. So I, I actually tend to lean that way that it was 6,000 years for each, uh, you know, for all six days of creation. And then the seventh day of rest being a thousand years as well. And, um, I actually kind of look at that as, uh, we know that the, when Christ returns, there will be a thousand year period of, of essentially rest. It's going to be a thousand year reign of Christ where there will be peace. Uh, and at that time, Satan will be locked in his prison and uh, reserved to be loosed again to deceive the world. So, But anyway, let's just go over a quick recap. Um, what we did cover was that on the first day, you know, we had the, basically we had the world was without form and void. We documented, first of all, it's, it's tohu vabohu in the Hebrew, and that that can mean that the earth was a wilderness or it was destroyed or lied waste, laid waste. Anyway, um, and if you're kind of wondering about that, you should check out the video I did called The World That Was. Uh, but we're not going to get into that because we're moving forward here. So, But we covered that, and then we covered also on the first day that light was created. God said, let there be light, and it was good. But that this light could not have been, uh, could not have been light from the sun because the sun and the moon were not created until the fourth day. And maybe, maybe they were created. They weren't brought into the picture until the fourth day. That would be Genesis chapter 1, verse 14. Um, we covered also that on the fifth day, we had all the life bearing sea creatures that were created and that possibly um, it might include those that live by the sea or, you know, thrive on the sea, meaning possibly the Asian peoples. I just threw that out there. I'm not saying that's what my thought was, but I have heard that in the past. Uh, they have a history that goes way back and even their history discusses a great flood and so forth that had come. So if they were destroyed in the flood, then how could they have that history of the flood? So really kind of interesting. Uh, but be that as it may. Anyway, we see also on the sixth day then, we covered that all beasts were created, beasts of the field. And, um, and also that man was created on the sixth day. And he was told to, it was male and female, and they were told to replenish or fill the earth. And then at the very end of it, it's in this first verse of chapter 2 of Genesis, we add all the hosts of both heaven and earth being finished. So, which brings to mind a question then, what what are we talking about with hosts in heaven and earth? Heaven, you know, what does heaven have to do with this whole six days of creation? But... If we, again, you can go check out the video, The World That Was, and and we will see that it, if this is the birth of a new age, it was both heaven and earth that were created. So, and, you know, one thing to, to just, um, I guess, question, if you would let me question it, is, you know, it says in Genesis 1, 1, that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. Now, those that believe in a young earth believe that um, that this earth being is is only six thousand years old, and that the creation is six days. Okay, but my question then is, that would mean that heaven would have to be only six thousand years old because he created heaven and earth, and the earth was without form and void. But 
So if they're saying that heavens is, is millions or billions of years old or indefinite, then how could you say that the earth is only 6,000 years old? Just a thought that I have for the, um, I guess, the young earth believers. Anyway, we do see that all the hosts of both heaven and earth were finished, and host itself means a mass of people. So there's a mass of people in heaven for sure, and or mass of souls, I should say, and a mass of souls possibly on the earth. Um, and they were told to be fruitful and multiply. And um, then we have the seventh day of rest. And that is where God rested from all his work. And uh, we're going to get into the, well, right after that, we had the preview sort of of the garden, the Garden of Eden. And it's interesting, a couple things that are worth pointing out here real quick, even though this is only a recap, we did study it in the last uh, in the last video, but there was no man to till the ground, well, which is interesting because we just heard that man was created on the sixth day, but this is after the seventh day, we have no man to till the ground, and therefore we had, or thereafter we had, Eth Ha'adam created, which is the man Adam created. So was this the same creation as the six day creation or was this in what you would call maybe an eighth day creation? Now I tend to believe, and this is only my opinion, but I believe that this is an eighth day, if there is such a thing, an eighth day create. It was after the seventh day that this was transpiring. Okay, and I'll point out a couple things here too because we had Eth Adam created, and then we had the trees planted in the tree of life and the tree of good and evil, and man told that he was not allowed to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But then after that, we have the creatures being formed out of the ground. But the, we know that in the first six days, the creatures, the beasts of the field, were formed or created before man. Now we have them being formed from the ground just as man was, but it was, they were formed after man, and they were brought forth to the man, and the man was to name them. And whatever he named them, that was the name. And I, I believe these are more domesticated creatures, maybe um, cows, horses, stuff like that, not the wild beasts um, of the field. Just an opinion of mine, but it's, it's an interesting thing, seeing that these things are taking place after man was created. Therefore, I think that this was particularly pertaining to the garden and that these were these were things that were grown or brought forth in the garden okay so uh and then we have god who said it wasn't good that man should be alone he was going to create a help meet for him and uh he caused a deep sleep to fall on man and he took a rib or a curve if you look at back into the Strong's Concordance, it, it's a curve taken from man to create the woman. Now, one point that I brought up in the last video was that uh, that this curve, it, it's interesting because a female has what they call the helix curve. It's part of their DNA, and uh, man doesn't have it. So, at least to the best of my knowledge anyway, but <laughs> that's... Uh, I thought, well, maybe this is what was taken from man. And um, anyway, woman was created. Woman being man taken from, uh, or woman taken from man, woo man, she was given a womb, right? And this is where children would be brought forth to replenish the earth. And then it was given, we had marriage that was created, that uh, a man shall leave his mother and father and cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And they, they were both naked, and they were not ashamed. And uh, being naked like that in the flesh is nothing to be really ashamed of, at least for most of us. So anyway, um, anyway, that's pretty much it. So we're going to get into, that's just a real recap of what we had in the last thing. We're going to get into Genesis 3. I want to say open up a little bit, bit of prayer here. Uh, let's pray. Let's approach our Father's throne here. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the study. Thank you for everybody who's tuning in to watch it and study with us today. 
Lord, we ask that your word be brought forth, that it be the Holy Spirit that speaks today, uh, and not a, my, not my own spirit. And uh, just ask that you would bless all those listening with discernment and understanding, and inspire them, Father, to dig in and uh, seek your truth, break it down, rightly divide it. And then, of course, we ask that you bless everybody with wisdom to be able to deliver it to others in ways that those others can hear it, where they can go to wherever that person's level of understanding is and deliver that message with surety, where that, that, that person can understand and come closer to you. And that's what this whole commission is about, bringing your children and expanding, you know, to you and expanding your kingdom. So we thank you, Father. We give you the praise for it. In the name of your Son and our Savior, Yeshua Messiah, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, so I thought that, uh, wow, you know, I haven't even bookmarked anything here. Uh, I should open up a couple. (laughs) I should open a couple of uh, books here. I want to go to Genesis 6. I think it's important, before we jump into... um, chapter three of Genesis, I want to lay a little groundwork here on, uh, actually I need to go to a couple other places here too. I need to lay a little bit of groundwork on the sons of God and it's going to pertain to this particular chapter uh, or to this particular study and um, you're going to find out why here momentarily. Let me bring up one more reference here. And we should be good. All right, I got everything ready to rock and roll here. Let me move this over here. You guys don't see what I'm doing here. So tell you what, I'll show you what I'm doing here. <laughs> I'm bringing up all my all my references because I forgot to load them all up. I load these up ahead of time so that I don't have to waste time you know, searching them out. I mean, if my internet quit or whatever, then I'd be kind of at a standstill. If I could have them preloaded, ready to go, then we're good. So I do want to get into the sons of God a little bit. Yeah, so we have a thorough understanding because we, listen, we have the sons of God. These are angels, right? And these angels, along with Satan, who is also a son of God, they deceived a third of the children of heaven in the world that was. This is my belief. Uh, It was that at this time, I think that they basically sealed their fate uh, for eternity. So, but I want to go through here. We know that, and I briefly covered this, uh, well, I covered it in depth, actually, in the world that was, but we have in, in Job 38, God is asking Job, whereupon are the foundations of the world fastened and who laid the cornerstone thereof and so on and so forth. And he says, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Well, we know that this was prior to the flesh because it's the very creation of the, of the world. And, uh, and there was no time in this world or this particular flesh age when all the sons of God shouted for joy. There was there was ab- absolutely since the beginning there was uh, conflict and we will cover that conflict today anyway but the sons of god they are angelic beings this is when all the children of god sang together we know that the third was deceived this had to be prior to then even those that deceived them satan lucifer himself along with his angels even they were part of this I guess you would call it eternal harmony or everlasting harmony in the hereafter, uh, which is, it was when iniquity was found in Satan that this all changed. So God's asking Job, where were you at this time when all, it was perfect harmony and it was on earth and and God obviously was there. So this was heaven on earth. Uh, My opinion again, but that's just, uh, I guess you could kind of say you we could document it or whatever a little bit, but I'm not going to get into that today. We've covered it in the last two videos. So I wanted to cover that. Now, if we go to Job 1, we could see also to further document who the sons of God are. Go down here into chapter 1, verse 6. Now, there was a day 
when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Okay, so if if the sons of God are not angels, how are they presenting themselves before the Lord? And, the, and Satan came also among them, it says. And the Lord said unto Satan. So we are definitely talking about an angelic realm here, a celestial realm. This is, I guess, this is in heaven. But listen, if he goes here in, in, in verse 7 here, and the Lord said unto say, Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. Well, we know that the fallen angels left their habitation. That's written, documented in Jude. I believe they came into this world and they were walking up and down in the earth. But they weren't in flesh bodies. They refused to partake of the flesh and they came in supernaturally. Now we'll go into chapter 2 here. Very same thing here. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. Well, obviously, he is one of the sons of God. He is, this is who he's hanging with. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From doing, from going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. And that's when he, he goes further on. Has Have you considered Job? And so on and so forth. And, and if you've read Job, you know the rest of the story. Satan afflicted Job pretty severely. But we have basically, the reason I came here is we have the sons of God walking to and fro in the earth. Now I want to go to Genesis 6, and we're going to see what they were doing when they were going to and fro on the earth. <clears throat> so, Genesis 6, and it came to pass when men began to multiply. Now this is after the man and the woman, Adam and Eve, were placed in the garden and so forth. But it says when... the because that was in chapter 3, chapter 2 actually, we're going to cover chapter 3, but it says when men began to multiply in the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them. Now this men is Adam, okay? And just to show you, we'll go in here. Oh, when men, right there, Hebrew, it's Hebrew 120 out of the Strong's Concordance, the Hebrew Dictionary. And the word is Adam. If you want to, actually see what it means it means man and it means to be ruddy ruddy complected they showed to show blood in the face now i'm not going to get into whether this was uh you know it there's some discussion about was does this document that this man was uh anglo-saxon or whatever white I'm not going to get into that right there. We know that the white man does show blood in the face, but this study is, we're going to go into some other things about it. You know, you can figure this part out yourself. But anyway, that's what it is. The word is Adam. Let me close that up. <clears throat> okay. Daughters were born unto them that the sons of God, in verse 2, that the sons of God saw the daughters of Adam, men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Well, what do you think that means? They took them wives. Well, it, it, is it some sort of spiritual uh, deception type thing? Well, let's see what it says here. Verse 3, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for, he, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years goes on here there were giants in the earth in those days and also that after that also after what after the days of noah's flood the flood that was to come there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of god came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown renowned for their ungodliness I would say, but they, they bear children to them. So this is not some sort of spiritual seduction. This is an actual act of physical, sexual seduction. Okay. Relations. 
where you have the sons of God, angelic beings, taking to wife the daughters of man and bearing these daughters of men bear children to the sons of God. And they were the giants, the Nephil, the Nephilim. So anyway, <laughs> I mean, I don't know how, how else you can, uh, you can call it out. So boy, I had a thought I was going to jump into here. Um, well, anyway, I, I wanted to point out here that the sons of God, this is a, some sort of hybrid type of offspring, these giants. And, um, but I'm pointing this out because to show that it is this act was possible. It it was it was done. The deed was done in Genesis six here, so that we we know that the sons of God had that ability to uh, to sire these beings, these giants, and that's why I brought this whole thing up here. So now we're going to go in, and it's going to pertain to the study here. So in Genesis chapter three. We're going to see what was going on in the garden. So let's go there right now. And you know what? I should, well, I was going to back it up to chapter two, but chapter three. Uh, we know that in chapter two, we covered in the recap that they were told they could not eat of the, uh, they could eat of any tree in the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they could not eat. Okay. They couldn't partake of it. Okay. Okay, so getting into Genesis chapter 3, word of wisdom from our Father. Father, we <laughs> please bless us with wisdom here in Jesus Christ's name. Genesis 3, 1 reads, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. Now who's the serpent? The serpent is the dragon, the devil. We know this by it is documented in Revelation chapter 12. It is Satan. More subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, and now I think we might actually have to go back into chapter 2 here. Uh, I want to back it up. Let's go back to chapter 2 real quick. Because we got to cover what actually God said. Let me find it here. Planted a garden eastward in Eden. Okay, he says, and out of the ground, and this is in when the garden was created and man was put in the garden, and out of the ground the Lord God uh, made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And, okay, so those trees were created there. Now, we go on down here. In verse 16, it says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but, in verse 17, But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. So what did he tell him he couldn't do? He couldn't eat of it. All right? So let's go back here now to, let's go back here to chapter 3, I guess ahead here. And the serpent is, is he's going to deceive the woman here. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, I don't think God said you shouldn't touch it. And I'm not, and obviously they shouldn't touch it, just to clarify, but she added this, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Something caused her to add this. So let's take a look at the at the Strongs here. And let's take a look at what that word touch means. It's uh, naga in the Hebrew dictionary, 5060. The word is naga. <clears throat> All right. Go right down to Strong's here. Naga, a prime root, properly to touch, to lay the hand upon for any purpose, euphemistically, or to lie with a woman. 
it also means other things too, to reach, to violently, to strike, so on and so forth. But I thought this was an interesting point that had to be brought up, right? To lie, that it means to lie with a woman. Is the woman here being, uh, is she being influenced in a way that would cause her to add that particular thing, that particular word? Neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Just an interesting point. We're gonna we're gonna cover a little bit more here that might bring this to light. Anyway, in verse four, and the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Well, obviously God didn't want them to know evil. He wanted them to know good. I think God had enough of evil back in the world prior, the you know the world that was the age prior. All right, and which is why this whole flesh age exists, in my opinion. But it was to know good and evil. He's trying to talk her into, hey, you, you know, you're going to be as gods. And the woman saw the tree. She saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasing to the eyes. All right, this is an important thing here. Let me ask you something. We covered previously, and I don't know, I think this is in Angels and Men. We covered uh, Ezekiel 28, which describes Satan in quite detail. He was created the most beautiful of all the angels. All right? Now, we know that a tree here, the tree's do not have knowledge of good and evil. They just simply have knowledge of when to shed their leaves and, you know, photosynthesis and stuff like that. So this tree is not a regular tree. Now, I will, I will put this out. Who is the tree of life? The tree of life is Christ. The tree of knowledge of good and evil, and we know that the serpent's already in the garden here, right? Right? This tree that he's probably wrapped around is probably Satan. All right? I want you to consider that. Because, you know, if you wanted to really break all this down, the tree and what it means, it refers to the trunk, you know, and from the trunk, all the branches that branch out from it are nourished, okay? It's like your central nervous system for the tree, Well, on man, we have the same type of thing. You have your spinal cord and it branches out and you have, um, you know, your circulatory system and all that. All of these things stem from your core, right? And obviously the heart keeps things going too, but, um, which is blood and stuff like that. But it's sort of the same type of, uh, structure. Okay, so what we have is is the spinal cord or in our trunk actually controls our limbs and everything like that. Now, obviously, it's our brain that feeds it down there, and but then from there it stems off. So, <clears throat> but we see here that the woman said that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and we know Satan was pleasant to the eyes, no doubt, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. All right, well, trees cannot make anyone wise. So this tree, like I said, is not a regular tree. And what did she do? She took the fruit thereof and did eat. And I'm sorry I keep highlighting all these things, but it's important to read these things. And she also, she gave unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. Now, they were not they were naked before and they were not ashamed, but suddenly they're ashamed. Okay? That's an interesting thing. Why are they ashamed that they're naked now, but not that they were then? And he, let's move on here. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now the figs are used to conceal things, right? It was to cover, to cover up. What were they cut? What do you cover up with an apron? Where do you wear an apron? Over your mouth? And first of all, this is not an apple that was of this fruit. And apple's not even mentioned in this in this chapter. If anything, it was a fig grove because they had fig leaves, right? So, but they made themselves aprons. Now, th- ask yourself, where 
do we wear an apron? We wear it around the waist. And if they're covering something up, it's probably covering up where they sinned, right? All right, so let's move on. Verse 8, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He was pretty ashamed of what he had done. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, and this is obviously typical of man, right? The woman whom thou gavest to be to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did it. And I did eat. So here we have man blaming the woman. <laughs> like it's all her fault. Well, he, I mean, aren't we accountable for ourselves? It's, you know? Yeah. Typical. Anyway, I'm sorry. I'm a man, so I could say that, right? But I know a lot of guys that would do that. And the Lord God said unto the woman, what is, what is this that thou hast done? And the And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Interesting. Let's take a look at that word beguiled here. The word is nasha in the Hebrew. And it's 5377 out of the Strong's. <clears throat> nasha. To lead astray, to delude, or morally to seduce, beguile, deceive greatly. Now we also have, boy, I wonder if I should have had it ready to go here. <clears throat> let me back this up, close this up here. I want to, let me, give me one second here. I'm going to look something else up here. Got to check something out. I want to document something out of the New Testament. Something Paul said here. I want to make sure I have the right reference. Oh, you know what? All right, I have it right here. Let me close this up. I'm going to bring this up for you. Now, this is Paul talking. Just something I want to, since we're talking about being beguiled, right? Let's take a look at what goes on in the New Testament. Paul Paul speaking here, right? 2 Corinthians. He's talking to those in Corinth and how he wants to present them to the Lord. Okay, he says, Would to God, and this is 2 Corinthians 11, chapter 11, verse 1. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly. And indeed, bear with me. Just hang in there with me. I mean, it wasn't really like, I think it might have been his speech because he kind of spoke a uh, colloquial Greek type. So he wasn't really um, uh, polished, I guess, in their language. But he's asking him to bear with them. He says, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband. And that Who's that husband? That husband is Christ, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Interesting point here. Let's take a look at this word here. Beguiled. Serpent beguiled. The word is espatio in the Greek. 1818 in the Greek Dictionary of the Strong's Concordance. Let's take a look what it means. Espatio, to seduce holy. That's what he did. All right, it doesn't mean anything else right there. So I wanted to bring that point up as documentation, what's going on here in the garden. So let's go on back here and, and read it. Read it again.
And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me. In other words, you could almost say, and the woman said, the serpent wholly seduced me and I did eat. And of course, I gave it to the husband too, brought him into the whole picture. So he ate. Now, did the husband eat of something from the woman? No, he ate of something from this tree. So what was going on here with the husband in this tree? Interesting point. Okay, and the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shall thou go. Now, it's a serpent. It's already on its belly. What does this mean? This is like a state of degradation, okay? You are lower than any beast of the field. Dust thou shalt eat all the days of thy life. Now we know the serpent is, it's not a talking serpent. We know the certain serpent is Satan. We know this, but you know, I'm going to document this. Let's go over here to Revelation 12. If you're not really sure if I'm telling you the truth or whatever. So let's move on here. We have the dragon, right? Here it is. Verse nine. Now let me go back up here. There was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not, neither was a place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him, the sons of God. Now this is yet to happen, because this is at the very end. Some people might think, that, oh, this already took place. I don't believe so. This is the very end, the final week of flesh before the second advent. But I wanted to document this. The serpent here is the devil and Satan, right? So let's go back here to to, uh, Genesis 3. So upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And now here, this is going to be really, really interesting. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed and it shall bruise thy head and thou shall bruise his heel what seed are we referring to well let's just take a peek here the word is zera hebrew 2233 out of the strongs here all right Figuratively, a fruit, plant, sowing time, posterity. Carnally, a child, a fruitful seed. So what do we have here? God's saying, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. Well, we know that her seed is going to be, it'll be ultimately Christ. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Well, obviously, the way to kill a serpent is to bruise their head, crush their head. Um, but I think it's, you know, many scholars believe the bruising of the heel is the crucifixion of Christ in this particular verse. All right, so I just want a little food for thought here. So we have a progeny or a posterity coming out of both the woman and the serpent. Interesting. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. Now, what does that have to do with eating an apple? Remember where they wore the apron? To hide where they had sinned, right? And here she is having her sorrow greatly multiplied in conception. Well, what kind of consequence do you have that where you have conception? It's where you had sinned. In sorrow thou shalt brought, shall bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. All right, and unto Adam, let's move on. I think we're making a point here that there was a sexual 
a sexual activity going on here in the garden. I mean, when the, obviously they made aprons to cover where they had sinned, and we have the woman who's uh, who's has great sorrow in conception. <laughs> you know, it's, I don't know how, what other picture you can draw from this, right? And unto Adam he said, "Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife." What's God saying here? You should never listen to it. No, we're not saying you should never listen to your wife, but in this case, he shouldn't have listened to her. And as eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shall thou eat of it all the days of thy life. And there you have the sin being introduced into the world. And it will continue until Christ returns, this sin. Thorns and thistles shall it shall bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Okay, so, and obviously this w can be documented that upon death we return to the dust of the earth, our, our flesh bodies do. Anyway, it moves on here in verse 20, and Adam called his wife's name Eve, his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Now this is where a lot of people say, see, she, they, were the first, they were the first in the world. People, listen, you, you can think that if you want. I'm not gonna dispute that, but the mother of all living is referring to through her and this lineage that would come from her would be he who is all living, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. It is through him that we have eternal life, all living. And beyond that, there is nothing after he returns. Well, I guess after the final judgment, there's nothing. It's all living. So just keep that in mind. I want to throw that out there. Unto Adam also, and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand, and take also of the tree of life, and eat and live forever. Well, that would be Christ. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence it was taken. So he drove the man, drove out the man, and he placed in the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. All right, so he wasn't going to be able to partake of the tree of life you know, at least not at that time. It would be through Christ that that well, not him, he wouldn't be alive at the time, but it would be through Christ that man would be able to, male and female, would be able to accept Christ as their Savior, repent, and and um, have eternal life. For Christ, uh, he died so that we could live. Okay, so it's an, kind of an interesting thing that we got going on here. So we see that there was some sort of a pretty serious, significant event that really ticked off God. Now, he wouldn't be mad if you had just eaten from a tree, you know, a regular tree, because these regular trees don't teach you how to be, how to be as gods, knowing good and evil. And the only reason that's it's written like that, God's knowing good and evil, is because no one else, they didn't know evil at the time. So the only other ones maybe in the garden would be those of the supernatural. So anyway, just a, a point being made. Now I want to move on real quick and cover, and I'm not going to make too much more of this, this study here. We, I think we made the point here. We knew that the sons of God came in under the daughters of man. And I'm going to, I'm going to tell you back there in Genesis six, I believe that was a hit on the lineage that Christ would come through. I think there was, that was like a contract out on him. And by actually targeting the daughters of Adam, the fallen angels 
attempted to destroy that lineage or pollute that lineage that Christ would come through. So I think that was a hit on the lineage of, of Christ. What's more is I think that was the second attempt at doing that. I think the first attempt was right here in the garden from Satan himself. I believe that was an attempt to destroy the lineage that Christ would come through. Because Satan knew that that Christ would come through this lineage of Eve, or of Adam, Adam and Eve. I believe that was a contract also. Well, I'm saying it like mob terms. Anyway, I believe it was it was an attempt to pollute that lineage. So I want to move on here to... I want to move on here a little bit to Genesis chapter 4. We've got to read this to understand what's going on. So going right into it here. And Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she, now, hey, she got a man from the Lord. Well, people will say, you know what? Let me read the next verse here. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Okay? Abel was a shepherd. Okay, so this word again here, let's take a look at this word again. She again, Yakov. I think that's how you pronounce it. Let's take a listen here. Strong's H3254. Yasaf. 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 I guess that was wrong. <laughs> yes, Saf. All right. But let's take a look here. Okay. The word again means to add or augment. To continue to do a thing. Okay. So when sh- it says here, let me close this here. When it says here, she again bears brothers, Abel, it means that she continued in labor, right? So she she conceived and bare Cain and said she had gotten a man from the Lord, and she again continued in labor and bare another one, Abel. So Abel and Cain were twins, you could say. All right, and in the process of time, we got to move on uh, here, but... It's, you'll see where I'm going with this in a moment. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had no respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. Well, Cain didn't give him of the firstlings like Abel did. Cain brought of the fruit of the ground, probably gave him the worst stuff that he picked and not the best. It wasn't his first fruits. It was just what he didn't want. That's why God had respect for Abel, but he didn't have any respect for Cain. And his countenance fell, right? And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. All right. And Cain talked with his brother Abel. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. Probably because he was jealous. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now thou, now thou art cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. Well, Cain probably... Buried, dug a hole and buried him. When till when thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shall thou be in the earth. So, in other words, he's he's a tiller of the soil, 
But the soil is not going to produce any, any fruit whatsoever all the days of his life. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from the face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. This is interesting that we have a mark here, because this is what I think like the very first mark of the beast. All right? And you'll see what I mean here momentarily. But, and Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch, and he builded a city and called his name, uh, called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. Now, there's a couple things I want to mention here. First of all, we have Cain, who has been basically exiled from the garden, and he went out from the presence of the Lord. He's got a mark on him now, so that no one could kill him. He dwelt in the land of Nod, and he he took his wife. He knew his wife and bare a son. Where did he get his wife? Interesting point, don't you think? Does anyone really ask these questions when, when they think about lineage and they think about Adam and Eve being the first on earth? Cain went to the land of Nod and took a wife. But now, he might have taken her with him, when he left the garden, she might have been there, but then that would mean that that it was his sister or something, right? But I thought that these things like incestuous affairs were forbidden. So there's a thought that I have here that if, if Adam was, as I kind of hinted to earlier, essentially created after the day of rest, the seventh day, then there's a whole six-day creation out there. And at that time, I think that's when all races were created. And I would say even, um, well, I guess all races, even the race of Adam, because the word in the sixth day is Adam as well. That Adam was created, man was created, male and female. So this wife, maybe she came from what we could call the six-day creation. I don't know. That's just an opinion of mine. It is an opinion. I do believe kind of that's that that's what's going on here. I don't believe this is a daughter of Adam and Eve. Um, and I don't believe that this incestuous activity was, was um, permitted. But it's just my opinion. Some people say it was permitted in that time because the law had not been created and so forth. Um, but we know that the law wasn't created when, when, um, Ham saw the nakedness of his father, Noah, and yet it was still forbidden. The law hadn't come, come into effect at that time. So anyway, I don't think God changes his opinion on things. I think if he if he makes something forbidden, it's forbidden, and he keeps it that way. I don't think he changes his mind, unless maybe he writes about it and says, I changed it. Anyway, also, the other thing I wanted to mention here is this is Enoch. Well, you know, people hear the book of Enoch and so on and so forth, right? And that he was, he walked with God and he was gone. This is not the same Enoch. All right, this is a child of Cain. The other Enoch is a descendant of Adam. All right, but let's just move on here real quick. We have in verse 418, unto Enoch was born, Irad and Irad, or Irad, beget Methu, uh, Mehuyael, and Mehuyael begat Methusael, and Methusael begat Lamech, and so on and so forth. I'm not going to go through the whole lineage of Cain here, all right, but I wanted to bring... I wanted to, 
to show that there is a lineage of Cain that should be read, right? Anyway, in this Lamech, he was not a very good guy because he said, if Cain shall be avenged seventy sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. I should back that up. And Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech. Hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man to my wounding and a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be avenged seven, sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. Now that's a declaration of his own. God is the one that said Cain would be avenged sevenfold. I don't know. Maybe Lamech thinks he's a god. I don't know. Let's move on here, though. There is a lineage of Cain. Now let's go on here. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son, and called his name Seth. For God said, she hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, who Cain, whom Cain slew. Now I think that Seth here, the word means, uh, it's Sheth. I think it might mean replacement or substitute. Let's Let's go on down here. Strong's substituted. All right. Anyway, I wanted to point that out. Now, and to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Let's move on here real quick to Genesis five. This is the book of the generations of Adam in the day that God created man in the likeness of God made he him. Made he fem- or male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day that they were created. And Adam lived an hundred and thirty years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. And the days of Adam after he had gotten Seth were eight hundred years and he begat sons and daughters. Now, and it says, in all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Okay, so something to point out here. We have a lineage of Adam here, and Seth is the first one in this lineage. Let me ask you, why is Cain not mentioned in this lineage? If Cain was a son of Adam, he would be mentioned here, don't you think? Cain has his own lineage in Genesis 4. But here we have Adam in his lineage. Cain's not even mentioned. Why not? Remember what God said? I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. All right? What are we talking about with seed? Posterity. The serpent obviously had seed. And Cain was not mentioned in Adam's lineage. So it, it, obviously you have to question this. Where did Cain come from? Was Cain Adam's child or was he a child of Satan, the serpent? Interesting point. You know, I I got another place I could go. Um, and uh, you know what? I'm going to do it. Let's uh, let's go ahead and bring this up. We're going to go to Matthew 13, and I I had no intention of going here, but I think it's important enough to to cover it here. I need to find it. You got to bear with me here. And what we're going to cover here is the parable of the tares. Now, in this chapter, he's he's um, Jesus is giving quite a bit. You know what? I have the description of it down there, but I got I got to back it up. I need to read. I need to read this parable for you guys. And I sorry, 
I should have had all this opened up. I guess that's what you get for not preparing too well. Here it is. All right. <clears throat> Starting here, Matthew 13, 24. All right. All right, another word of wisdom from our Father. Thank you, Father. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in the field? From whence then hath it tares? Where are these tares coming from if you all you sowed was good seed? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? You want us to go and gather up those tares? He said, But he said, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. All right. Now, I got to move on down here because he he speaks another parable. And then the his apostles are going to come and and ask him about this parable of the tares. So Jesus, it says here in verse uh, 36, Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. They wanted to know what he meant by that. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. All right? Now, what was going on in Genesis chapter 3? Who was in there? Is that when we had the tares being sowed? You know, you you can call this uh, controversial or not, but I'm just reading out of God's word. And if we don't, if we don't ask questions when we study questions like this, these are not these are not necessarily pleasant to ask. But it doesn't do us any good to get down to where the rubber meets the road. I mean, to knock it down to where the rubber meets the road and dig out the truth. We have to dig it out, whether it tastes good or not. Goes on here, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels and shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity. What was that that was found in the serpent? Iniquity. Ezekiel 28. And shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be a wailing and a gnashing of teeth. How is Satan going to be consumed? Turn to ashes from within. Ezekiel 28. It's talking about the final judgment here. The harvest. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Do you have ears to hear? Because not everyone does. We clearly see that the tares were sown And the tares and the wheat look a lot alike. And they should not be plucked up because lest you pluck up the wheat with them. And we're here, it's 
listen, we are here to bring children to God, but we are not here to kill them. And if you want to identify these terrors in this time, you're probably going to identify the wrong people. So we need to be really careful about when we're pointing fingers at these people and those people and separating them when we may not know. We may not be able to tell them apart except for the fact that they bear bad fruit. So be a fruit inspector. All right, so back to Genesis. Uh, And I'm going to wrap it up here. But uh, I just thought it was interesting. We have the lineage of Adam. Cain is never mentioned in his lineage. We're going to dig way more into Cain later and his lineage. uh, Because I believe they made it through the flood of Noah, which is another issue altogether. Personally, um, you know what? I don't want to, I'm going to leave you with that on that. So I believe they made it through the flood and I'll tell you, well, we know that the giants made it through the flood, right? So, because they were present, but that'll be, you know, I think that'll be a video or a, uh, yeah, video, a study on the flood of Noah itself. But anyway, that's about it. We had, uh, we, we documented here that we had the sons of God that were able to impregnate women, the daughters of Adam. I believe that was a hit on the lineage of, of uh, Adam, the second hit. I think the first one was in the garden, and I think it was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. I believe that was Satan. You know, the tree and the, and the serpent are one. All right. He was telling them to partake of him. And we read that in Corinthians that Paul wanted to present the people of Corinth as a chaste virgin, unlike, you know, to Christ, unlike Eve, who was wholly seduced, espatio, by the serpent. We know that the serpent is the devil and Satan, same thing, Revelation chapter 12. What else do you get out of it? When they sewed aprons together, they, they covered where they hid, uh, or they hid what they, where they had sinned. And the consequence of this action is conception. I mean, really, what other picture can you draw from this? There was a sexual event that occurred in the garden. I believe I believe what we had then was twin sons, possibly from different fathers. Cain from the one and Abel from Adam. But that's, you know, you got to figure, you, you have to come to your own conclusion on this. I It's a very controversial thing, but nowhere in Adam's lineage is... Cain ever mentioned, and there are other places in Scripture where Cain is mentioned. All right. Namely, the scribes and the Pharisees. Anyway, I'm going to leave you all with that. Hey, listen, it's been great studying here with you today. So if you like the video, just do me a favor and share it. Really, we're out here to bring people to the Lord and expand his kingdom, and if we don't share his word, um, you know, it. I guess it doesn't grow. It he, God allows the increase, but he does it through us by bringing his word to the world. That's how it, his kingdom grows here. And um, so I ask that you share it. And listen, I would, you know, please leave some comments. Man, you know, I do these videos and like, I get comments on Facebook and so forth, but I never get comments on the videos themselves on YouTube. So, I mean, I don't have to. It's no big deal. I I appreciate all the other comments, but I get 
I get a few thumbs up and stuff, but no one ever says anything about it. I mean, not even a question, you know, at least some questions or something. Let's get some dialogue going here. But anyway, so if you could comment, that'd be great. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please subscribe, share it with others, tell others to subscribe. That would be greatly appreciated. Um, and that's about it. Listen, I'm not sure where this is going to go next. Might go into the flood because we have already touched on Genesis 6. So we'll see where the Father brings us, brings, brings us next. It's a hard one to say. Anyway, everybody, thanks for everything. God bless you, and we'll see you in the next video. Take care. You know, it occurred to me that I did not close in prayer in the video, so I wanted to do that right now. Let's approach our Father's throne. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the study. We thank you so much for your written word, and we thank you for your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we appreciate uh, all those who have joined us here today. I ask that you be with all of them. Bless us all with what understanding of your word and discernment and father bless us with the wisdom to deliver it as you see fit to all of your children who have not heard it. And, uh, we thank you for it. We thank you for your plan of salvation through Christ. And we give you the praise for all of these things in his precious name, Yeshua Messiah, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, gang. I just wanted to I just wanted to include that because well, it's a good thing. Jesus is the living word. So, hey, listen, if you enjoy the video, uh, I do ask that you would like it. And uh if you didn't enjoy it, still like it. <laughs> anyway, but if you could uh comment on it and uh share it and subscribe to the channel. That'd be great. Tell others to subscribe, share it on all your social media. It would be greatly appreciated. And, um, it lets me know how pleased the father is the more people chime in. So I'm grateful for it anyway. Thanks. And we'll just leave you with that. I'll see you in the next video. God bless. Bye.